So you know when you're turning back around and you're getting onto the plane back home, how would you feel? Salty, right? You feel really salty. And that's how they feel. They feel very salty. Here, Umar radiallahu anh feels so salty. He's like, um, I, we don't want to go back. We're going to do whatever it takes. If we have to die, we'll die. It's okay. At least we die in honor. Why should we uh, go back home in disgrace? And this is, a, you know, this is something very serious. Why should we go back home in disgrace? We'll rather die in honor. And the Prophet says to him, Omar, we're going back home. Okay? Now what happens here at this moment, the reason why I shared this incident is because of what happened right now. What happens now is, the Prophet told the companions, we're going back to Medina. And in order to do that, you need to exit the state of Ihram, which is a, which is a ritual state. Everyone needs to exit that, and the way you exit that is by sacrificing an animal, shaving your head, and then coming back into your normal clothes from the two pieces of white cloth they were wrapped in. When he makes his statement, the companions stopped and nobody got up. Nobody moved. The Prophet said to the companions, everyone, get out, we're going back to Medina, and nobody moved. Everyone sat there. Now, this is such a difficult situation because this is the first time in the Prophet's life where the Prophet has told the companions to do something. They haven't said no, but what? they just froze. And it's a human thing, you guys understand? It's not an act of disobedience. It's like, you know, what's going on? And everyone's just emotionally destroyed. They're just saying, like, what's going on? And nobody's moving. And this, the historians say, was one of the most difficult moments in the Prophet's life. What does he do now? The people who gave oath to him and were his companions and did everything for him, he just told them, we're going back to Medina and nobody's moving. So the Prophet came back into his tent and his wife, Umm Salama, was there. He said to Umm Salama that I just told them that we have to go back and everyone's sitting, nobody got up, nobody's doing anything. So then she said, O oh, Messenger of God, they're not disobeying you, they're just in shock right now. And the best way for you to deal with this is to show them that you have made the decision and you are definitely going back and there's no way out. Why don't you go shave your head and sacrifice your animal in front of them? The Prophet then went outside, he sacrificed his animal, he shaved his head, and that's when the companions woke up. Oh my God, it's real. And they then sacrificed the animal, shaved their head, and they came back. So the scholars, they say, one of the most important pieces of advice ever given to the Prophet, I mean, not ever, that's not fair either, but you know, one of the more important pieces of advice given to the Prophet during his life is by who? It's by a female companion. Umm Salama radiallahu anha. So I'm listening to this person, he's saying that, shawiruhunna wa khalifuhunna, take advice from them and do exactly opposite of what they're saying, and it's absurd. Because the Prophet wasn't that sort of a person. Any person that came to the Prophet ﷺ, anyone that came got a fair piece of the Prophet's time. The Prophet's going for Eid prayer, which is, you know, the festivity. He's going for Eid prayer, and when he's going, they're all dressed nicely, everyone's dressed in their gowns, they've applied fragrance to themselves, and on the way to the prayer area, the Prophet notices that there's a young kid sitting on the side of the road, and he's sitting there and he's crying. And the Prophet, he sat next to that kid. And the companions are there. The Prophet said, you guys go ahead. I'm going to sit with this kid for a little bit. And he's the Prophet of Allah. And he's this young kid. He sits next to him. He says, what's wrong? He said, today all the kids are going for Eid and they're holding their father's hands. My father was martyred in the battle and I don't have anyone's hand to hold on the way to Eid. And the Prophet feels it. You know that empathy I was talking about? You know why he feels it? Why does he feel it? He was an orphan himself. And he can relate to sitting there on the side of the road looking for a father to push him on the swing while all the other kids are being pushed and there's no one coming to push him. He's a kid. I mean, he, he was a kid too. And the Prophet really felt that. And he said to this kid, you know, you want someone's hand to hold? Hold my hand. And that's an honor that's reserved for that kid. The Prophet wasallam took him one narration mentions he held his hand. The other narration mentions the Prophet actually lifted him on his shoulder and carried him on his, for, on his shoulders all the way to the area of the Eid. And the Prophet then sat him down on his lap and he gave the khutbah with him on the lap. And then after that one narration says, at the end of it, the Prophet said, after today you will never say you are an orphan for Muhammad is your father and Aisha is your mother. Not literally father and mother, but you guys understand. It's like a, it's like a relationship that will always be there. You ever need anything, you come back here. And then there are, there's a lady that comes to the Prophet, peace be upon him. She says she had a marital issue. You know, people have marital issues. And she comes to the Prophet, peace be upon him, with a marital issue. She says, oh, messenger of God, I was married to this man. Him and I lived together for a long time. I gave birth to his kids. And then one day, he comes home and says to me, Anti alayya kawahri ummi. Those were the exact words he used. Anti alayya kawahri ummi. Which was a statement that Arabs would use to divorce their wives. But it wasn't saying, I divorce you. Rather, they would say, you are to me like the back of my mother. It was a very disrespectful way of divorcing someone. You guys understand? You're not, one thing is, all right, say, you're divorced. That's okay. I mean, it's not okay, but, you know, it's acceptable. 
You're being honest with me, okay? I understand. But you know, when you're being honest with someone, you have to learn there are boundaries of being honest as well. Some people, they overdo the whole divorce thing. Like there was one case that I dealt with, I mean, not one case, it's becoming very common right now, that people are divorcing each other through text message. You know, there has to be some respect and some honor for marriage that you're just ending something so sacred, something so important through text. I got a message one day, one sister, she said to me, Sheikh, I have an issue, can you answer it? I said, go ahead. So she sends me a screenshot of a conversation she had with her husband. This is what, this is what the screenshot read. So this girl and her husband were going through some issues and they were going through a separation. So during the separation, he was with his parents and she was living at their home. So she sent him a text message, listen carefully, okay? So it's a screenshot, I'm looking at the screenshot. The first text said, when will you be gone for good? What did the first text say? When will you be gone for good? His response is, you want me gone? Question mark. Divorce, divorce, divorce. Right? That's five texts right there. It's crazy, right? When will you be gone for good? It's escalated so quick. When will you be gone for good? You want me gone? Divorce, divorce, divorce. And then star home. The G is next to H and the M is next to N. Rather than saying, when will you be gone for good? She was trying to type, when will you be home for good? You want me gone? Divorce, divorce, divorce. Star home. And I looked at this and I hold my hand like, oh my goodness. This is like a very messed up situation. I was on, and it leads down to this whole idea of people not having value for divorce, but they're just throwing it around in jokes. I went on Facebook the other day, and a guy, him and his wife were in an argument, and he goes to her Facebook wall and types in divorce, 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 and tags her. <laughs> on her wall. You know, we're laughing at this. She must have been crying. Can you imagine what that lady must be experiencing? Her husband humiliated her in front of everyone and writes divorce, 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 and has the audacity to tag her. That guy must have been 16 years old, but that kind of attitude, right? And there was one guy, I was in, I was in San Francisco. You guys are probably getting depressed right now, right? Last story, I promise. <laughs> I was in San Francisco, and I landed at the airport, and I get this message. Guy says to me, Sheikh, I got a problem. I said, what's the problem? He said, I divorced my wife, and she's not accepting it. I said, okay. Why is she not accepting it? She said, oh, well. He said, because I gave, it through, I gave her a divorce through video. I said, what? Are you out of your mind? Like, I said, what do you mean? And he sends me the link of a YouTube video. <laughs> and I was like, oh no, 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 no. And I clicked on it and you won't believe, guess what he did? He gave it, he, this, he did a ca inward camera recording of himself giving his wife divorce and then uploaded it on YouTube. And I said, why would you do that? He said, to remind her of the pain she caused me. Right? To remind her of the pain she caused me. And you know, it just leads back to this point where people have no value for divorce. Anyway, so this person, this lady comes to the Prophet and says to him, that my husband said to me, Anti ummi, you are to me like the back of my mother. What's the legal ruling on this statement? So the Prophet, peace be upon him, said that Islam has not come to abolish culture. Unless something clearly is in the Quran that contradicts the culture, we uphold culture. You guys understand that? Which is a very important principle, by the way. So you know how some people, they think that uh, eating or dressing a particular garment that's not quote-unquote Muslim is haram? That's not true. Islam has nothing against culture. You guys follow that here? Islam has nothing against culture at all. So you know, um, wearing a suit or wearing, I don't know, wearing pants or wearing jeans or wearing a shirt, these things are not haram at all. They're completely okay, actually. Now you guys are probably thinking, why are you wearing what you're wearing then? Well, that's because I sell these. <laughs> this right here is a shameless act of marketing. <laughs> with an intention that you got. Anyway, right? <laughs> so the prophet says to this lady that um, we uphold culture. And if the culture is that that sort of a statement results in a divorce, that, that sort of a statement will be a divorce. So this lady says, oh, messenger of God, but how could it be a divorce? I gave my life to him. I dedicated my life to this guy. And if he's going to divorce me, he's not man enough to say it to my face and he wants to use silly terms like this. She says, I want you to rethink it. Now, imagine this for a second. Okay? Imagine you going to your imam. Your imam gives you a fatwa and you say, I'm not accepting it. Rethink it. What would imam do? <laughs> I think, uh, I'm going to give you one across your face right now. <laughs> you get out of here right now. <laughs> I can imagine a hundred things that would be said. Right? I'm not even going to say them. It's being recorded. Anyway. <laughs> so... I'm so tempted though, I'm not going to. Um, so anyway, the she says, 
So she says to the messenger of God, she says, the prophet, peace be upon him, that I want you to reconsider your opinion. And uh, the prophet says, well, I, I mean, it, I, these are not my rulings. These are, this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This, this is how the deen works. It's not based off me, what I want. It's all based off of Allah. Now, this becomes very intense. She says, okay, if you're not going to listen to me, and if you're not going to give consideration, if you're not going to rethink your opinion, then you know what? I'm just going to complain to Allah directly. And she starts screaming out loud. Ya Allah, you're a messenger, and I need your help, and this cannot be a divorce. And she's just speaking to Allah directly. And someone that was there, some companions, they said, what are you doing? Shh. Like, you know, the prophet's there, there are people here, what are you doing? She said, you know what? I'm just going to call it Allah directly. If Muhammad doesn't listen, let, it, let, let the Rabb of Muhammad listen. And she starts crying. And in the, in the midst of this incident, the Prophet ﷺ lowers his head, and sweat begins to perspire on his forehead, which was a sign of? Revelation. So someone says to her, stop, stop, revelation. She says, not until it's been revealed and recited. <laughs> not until it's been revealed and recited. I'm, gonna, I'm not stopping. I just broke the shock. Um, so what happened then was that, um, anyway, a little while later, the Prophet ﷺ lifted his forehead. And then he said to the lady, قَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى بَعْدَ عَوْدُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانَ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ قَدَ سَمِعَ اللَّهُ قَوْلَ الَّتِي تُجَادِلُكَ فِي زَوْجِهَا وَتَشْتَكِي إِلَى اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ يَسْمَعُ تَحَاوَرَكُمَا إِنَّ اللَّهَ سَمِيعٌ بَصِيرٌ أَلَّذِينَ يُظَاهِرُونَ مِنْكُمْ مِنْ نِسَائِهِمْ مَا هُنَّ أُمَّهَاتِهِمْ إِنْ أُمَّهَاتُهُمْ إِلَّا اللَّائِي وَلَدْنَهُمْ وَإِنَّهُمْ لَيَقُولُونَ مُنْكَرًا مِنَ الْقَوْلِ وَزُورًا وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَعَفُونَ غَفُورٌ And the verses continue on. The whole chapter, that chapter of the Quran is actually called Al-Mujadalah. You know what Al-Mujadalah means? The lady who came to debate. It's actually called that. That whole chapter of the Quran is actually called Al-Mujadalah. And Mujadala isn't necessarily only a debate. It's, more of, it's a debate with a little argumentation to it as well. Right? The lady who came to debate with the Prophet. And you have to realize, at no point, the Prophet ﷺ respectfully told her that I can't change the ruling, which was his honesty as a Prophet. But at the same time, did he brush her off, get angry at her, shout at her at any period, or afterwards tell her that you raised your voice in my presence, you should be banished from the community? Not at all. And that's who the Prophet actually was. He was a person that anyone could approach. The famous narration, a young man comes to the Prophet and says to him, O Messenger of God, I have an urging desire to commit adultery. Now, again, I want you to imagine this for a second. Imagine someone comes to your local imam and says, Sheikh, I have an urging desire to commit adultery. What would that imam say? Get out of here. Call his parents. We need to restrict his usage of the internet. Put filters on his phone. Get rid of the Wi-Fi. And you know, you can think of a hundred things that would be said about this person. Brother, you are going to Jahannam. Please never give adhan in our masjid again. Wash your face and your body before coming back into the boundaries of the masjid. You know, silly things would be said. I mean, you can take them however you want to, okay? I don't want to be judgmental. But here the Prophet ﷺ, how does he deal with it? He says to the young man, now he has a window right here, a very short window, a very small window of dealing with this person. He can either say yes, or he can say no. Which one does he say? You got it, go ahead. He said neither. He didn't say yes or no. Because yes or no is not the answer to issues. This is such a beautiful lesson of human psychology. When people ask you questions, half the time they don't need a yes or no. People already know that. You think the guy didn't know the fiqh of committing zina? You think this guy didn't know the legal ruling on committing zina? Yes or no? Of course you know. Everybody knows the legal ruling on committing zina. You don't commit zina. It's obvious, right? He didn't come for the fatwa. The Prophet didn't need to give him a fatwa. He came because he was going through something and he needed advice. So the Prophet, rather than giving him a yes or no, because those answers are most of the times absolutely irrelevant. He's giving him an answer that's relevant, and that is to take him into a reflective state. The Prophet takes him to a reflective state. And what's a reflective state? The Prophet says, okay, look, how about this? What if someone was to consider doing a similar thing to your sister, how would you feel? And that person says, ew, no way. And the Prophet says, what about someone to do a similar thing to your mother? He says, no way. Your aunt, no way. The Prophet says, well then the person who you're intending to do it with is also someone else's relative. That's not a good thing. Just as you wouldn't like for someone to do it to your relative without making a full lifetime commitment of marriage to them, similarly, why should you do that to someone else's relative? And this young man says, after that day, that thought never crossed my mind again. And this is what we call positive and negative reinforcement. In psychology, what do we call this? 
So there's the idea of positive enforcement and negative enforcement, reinforcement, okay? So you know, have you guys noticed that on every secret passage, what does it say? Hey, this will kill you, this is bad for you, this is this, this is that, disease, and they have all these signs on there. So the psyche behind that is that it's negative reinforcement. You repeat the statement again and again and again and again a million times until the person finally believes it. You guys understand that? So it's, I, the whole, it's, the, it's, the, it's a philosophy behind Islamophobia. Well, you repeat it again and again. Muslims are criminals, Muslims are criminals, Muslims are criminals, Muslims are criminals. When you say it a million times, what's going to happen ultimately? Hey, Muslims are criminals. I was in a, Atlanta maybe like a month ago, and a very interesting story happened. So I was in Atlanta, and I, um, it was in March or February? Maybe in March. So I, was, uh, I got to the airport, and the guy that was supposed to, the brother that was supposed to pick, pick, pick me up was half an hour late. So he texted me saying, hey, Sheikh, I'm in traffic, I'm a little late. I said, okay, don't worry about it. So I got to the arrival lounge, and there, were these, um, there was a little seating area, but all the, seating, all the seats on them had handicapped signs. So I sat down in one of them. A little while later, this 75-year-old lady comes, and she says, excuse me, sir, why are you sitting here? And she wasn't a worker at the airport, by the way. She was just another passenger, like I was a passenger. So I said to her, you know, I had back surgery two months ago. I had spinal surgery two months ago, so I can't stand for long. That's why I'm sitting here. So she sat down next to me. And by the way, that's why I'm sitting right now. Usually I would stand up and give a lecture, but I can't. So she sat down next to me, and we were, and then uh, I said to her, where are you going? She said, I'm going to Chicago. I said, what are you going to do in Chicago? She said, my brother, uh, he's, he has cancer, and he's, uh, he's probably going to die. He's in the last phase of his life. By the way, when she told me to get up from the chair, I kind of watered the toe down. She was shouting at me, by the way. She was really aggressive when she told me to get up from the chair. So I said to her, you know, um, life is short. Everybody's, you know, this is a cycle of life. People live, people die. And whatever life we have, we should dedicate it to doing good, being nice to people, not being harsh. So when I, <laughs> when I said that to her, she said to me, well, we're trying to do good in our country, but your people keep killing our people. I was like, oh my goodness. She pulled all guns down. She's like firing at me. So I said to her, hey, calm down, calm down. Take it easy. Who got shot? So then she started listing a bunch of people that unfortunately were killed. And, um, and I said to her, look, we have a population of 1.6 billion. And considering we only have a few hundred lunatics, we're doing good for ourselves, right? And whichever religion you belong to, you guys have a history too. And then after that, I said to her, well, you have to realize that there are Muslims that are innocently killed as well. It's not an idea of religion encouraging <laughs> killing innocents. Rather, it's an idea of fanaticists encouraging to push their agenda, and people use different means of doing that. And she said to me, prove to me any Muslim in America that was innocent, in, innocently killed. I said, uh, Chapel Hill? She said, I've never heard of it. I said, what? You haven't heard of Chapel Hill? There were three innocent people that were killed, college-going kids. And she didn't believe me until I sat there and told the whole story. I said, you know, I know this family very well, and blah, blah, blah. And then her and I had this discussion. We started talking. She started explaining to me. She's 75 years old. How her kids didn't like her, but they were forced to take care of her, and she had to work to t get this ticket together to go to Chicago. And then I explained to her how in Islam, there's a great importance for parents, and we're always supposed to look after our parents. And we had this long, but only 15 minute discussion. In 15 minutes, we covered so much. At the end of it, I got this text from a brother. He said, Sheikh, I'm outside. So I said to this lady, hey, I gotta go. So she said to me, I want you to know that in the past 15 minutes, you changed my perspective of Islam. 15 minutes ago, I hated Islam, and I don't think I'll ever hate it again in my life. So I said, Alhamdulillah, you know, that makes waiting here um, something that was beneficial for me. So when I'm getting up to leave, now she says to me, I have one request. I said, what is it? She said, can you please give me a hug? <laughs> I'm like, oh my goodness. What's the fifth of giving a hug? Now while I'm thinking of all the fifth, this lady just comes and gives me the hug. <laughs> She's 75 years old, so guys, just relax a little, okay? Take it easy. <laughs> Take it easy, calm down, breathe. Fusa, right? <laughs> She's 75 years old. She comes and gives me a hug. After I'm done, I say, uh, it was nice meeting you. She says, you know what? I want to take a selfie with you, too. <laughs> I was like, look at these aunties, man. <laughs> 80 years old, you're taking a selfie? Once I was in Dallas... And I gave a lecture. Actually, yeah, Dallas, Texas, yeah. So I gave a lecture in Dallas. I'm not going to say where in Dallas. It was in Dallas somewhere. So after the lecture was over, I knew you were going to raise your hand, so I knew it. That's why I didn't want to say it. So, uh, so I gave a lecture in Dallas. And um, after the lecture was over, this lady, she called me. 
She said to me, hey, uh, is this Mufti Kamani? I said, yes. She said, well, my son attended a lecture. He loved it. My daughter-in-law attended a lecture. My niece, my granddaughter attended a lecture. They all loved it. But unfortunately, I couldn't come. So I said, oh, you know, I apologize that you couldn't make it. Inshallah, Allah give you shifa. She was very old. She was 80 years old. I hope you feel better. So then she said to me that um, because I couldn't attend, I would like for you to come visit me. <laughs> so I would say, auntie, I would love to, but I'm on a tight schedule. I can't make... Um, private visits at people's homes and I, ha I have a lot to do and plus I don't have a car and I made some excuses and I said to her I can't make it so then she blackmailed me she said to me Agar tu mera beta hai, tu <laughs> that if you are my son you're gonna come now we have a relationship by the way but she just it's an auntie blackmail she said that and put the phone down so I'm thinking to myself oh my god this auntie really wants me to come but you know what I don't have a ride and right when I was thinking that one of my buddies passed by he said, Sheikh, who was that? I said, it was some lady who wanted me to visit her. He said, I'll take you. <laughs> I was like, gosh, man. I wanted to go to sleep. So I said, you know what? I don't know her address. So just so that I wouldn't be held accountable by Allah, I pulled my phone out. And I sent this 80-year-old lady a text message. And the text was ADD question mark. I thought she wouldn't figure out what I was asking for, right? I'm like, how is she going to know ad is an abbreviation of address? And she's going to know I'm asking for it. She'd probably think it was a typo. Or maybe like, you know, my kid texted her or something. So I ADD question mark, and 10 seconds later, her address comes through. I was like, darn these aunties, man. So tech savvy. So anyway, I went to her house, and it was actually one of the most interesting gatherings that I had. I sat with her for one hour, and for one hour, you know what she did? She talked about how beautiful she was the day she got married. <laughs> That, oh, I was wearing this garment, and I was wearing this, and this lenga, and this da 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 blah, blah, blah. She's telling me all this stuff, and I'm like, auntie, I gotta go, I gotta go, I gotta go. And she's just telling me the story. At the end of it anyway, I said to her, auntie, you know what? I had a great time, I need to go. However, if I may, can I share some poetry with you? I love Urdu poetry, by the way. I was oblivious of the Urdu language until I went to college. When I went to college, I took some Urdu classes, and I fell in love with the language. It's such a beautiful language, okay? Um, and I said to her, Andi, I would like to share some, share some Urdu poetry with you. Do you guys understand Urdu? Anyone here? Yeah. Oh, wow. It's like in Pakistan or something, right? <laughs> so I said, okay, um, let me share some Urdu poetry. She said, go ahead. So I said to her, Chahte hai wo ke makeup se hoor ho jaye. Chahte hai wo ke makeup se hoor ho jaye. Kya mumkin hai ke kishmish dubara angur ho jaye. So I said to her, that they desire that by applying makeup, they can turn it into the women of paradise. But is it possible to, re to reverse a raisin into a grape again? Once the juice is gone, it's gone. <laughs> and she said, tu to bada batamiz nikla. <laughs> you are a very disrespectful young kid. Get out of my house. Anyways, I'll love anyway. <laughs> so here you have an example of an individual who's coming to the Prophet wasalam, and is sharing their incident with the Prophet, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I have an issue. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals an entire surah of the Quran. First story. The second story I was sharing with you is regarding the young man and the Prophet ﷺ takes him into a reflective state. That here, this is how you're supposed to think of the issue. So when we say the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him was a mercy to mankind, that's no exaggeration. It's actually very real. And I only gave you guys a few examples and trust me, I can go on and on and on. And this is the subject of the Prophet ﷺ's life, the stories and lessons we learned from his life. That's an ongoing discussion that will continue until the Day of Judgment. Muslims have been writing on this topic for over a millennium. And I can be honest with you, we haven't even hit the tip of the iceberg. There's so much that's being produced every day, so much being produced again and again and again. And scholars are still writing about the state and the life of the Prophet, peace be upon him, because it was so unique. It's a kanzun la it's a, it's a treasure box that never comes to an end. It continues on and on and on and on. And that's why I said to you guys initially, if you remember at the beginning of the lecture, that learning the life of the Prophet is imperative on the Muslim. Why so? Because Allah tells us that if you wish to love Allah, follow me, I will love you. Why is it important to love the Prophet ﷺ? I told you two reasons. The first reason that I said to you was because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed the Prophet, peace be upon him, on the most suitable and most appropriate way to teach us to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the second thing, the second benefit, the second main reason, out of hundreds of reasons that could potentially be put together, the second great reason of, for, for us to build a connection with the Prophet ﷺ is because he is beloved by Allah. That's it. You know, when someone is beloved to someone, the best way to get close to that someone is to get close to that someone. You guys understand that? So we have a word for this in Urdu. We call it Mahabub Gar. 
Mahbub Dar means the beloved of a beloved is a beloved. So I'll give you an example. Let's say, for example, I invite you over to my house. And you come over to my house, and I have kids, as I mentioned earlier. You bring a gift for me, but not for my kids, and my son is standing at the sideline watching. Will that make me happy or sad? It'll make me upset. Why is that? I'd rather you not give me a gift and get the gift for someone who I love. Right? You get the gift for my child. And if you get my child a gift and don't give me anything, do you think I'll get offended at all? Ask any parent in the world and they'll tell you, they not, only, not only will they not get offended, they'll feel honored. That you knew the right way to honor them, which was to look after their kids, to respect their kids, to love their kids, to make dua for their kids. You know a mother, when she goes to a scholar or a sheikh, you know what she'll always say? Say it, go ahead. Make dua for my kids. She'll always say, make dua for my kids. It's the most common thing. And I always follow up with one thing. I say, what about you? And they say, if you make du'a for my kids, you've made du'a for me. It's so, it's a very ajib, a very interesting relationship that a mother has with her children. And if that's the love that a mother or a father, both as well, a parent can have for their child, imagine the love Allah has for his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's something that's beyond us. There's only one person in the entire Qur'an who Allah takes an oath by his entire life, and that's the Prophet sallallahu Allah says, لَعَمْرُكْ Allah takes an oath by the entire life of the Prophet. Because every aspect of his life was magnificent. Every aspect of his life was superb. It was on point. There was nothing in his life that was in vain, that was wasteful. And that's why it's very important for us to learn about the life of the Prophet I delivered a seminar on the Prophet's biography last weekend. Yeah, it was last weekend. In Dayton, Ohio. And uh, it was interesting because when I was delivering the seminar, there were these two 14-year-old girls, 14, 15-year-old girls. They were running around at the back. You're just causing ruckus, making a lot of noise. So uh, I had a Friday evening lecture. Then I had the seminar was all Saturday and all Sunday. It was a whole weekend's class. So at the end of the, um, at the, end of the Friday evening class, I asked one of the guys, hey, you know, who, who are the parents of those girls? So they said, a so-and-so person. So I went to meet that person and I said, um, hey, I hope your daughters enjoyed the lecture. So the guy said to me, well, I hope they did too. I had to bribe them to bring them here, right? They didn't want to come. They, they just didn't want to come. I had to bribe them to bring them here. He said, I don't think they're going to come tomorrow anyway, but hopefully they benefited. The next day when I came to class Saturday, I was amazed to see those same two girls were sitting right there. And this time they weren't causing ruckus. They were actually sitting down. So I said to the father that if you had to bribe them to come for one hour Friday evening, I wonder how much you had to bribe them to come for seven hours on Saturday. So he said to me, um, they actually woke up before we did, and they said they wanted to come. And he said, this is the first time my daughters have ever said they wanted to go to a lecture. Sunday comes, and those girls are there again. So at the end of my, sem at the end of my seminar, I had a, a certification ceremony. So basically, those who attended the seminar, we gave them certification. So I called one of those girls, and I said to them, I want you to sit next to me, and I want you to write the name of each attendee on the, sem on the certificate and give it to me, and I'll sign it off. So one of the guys came to me afterwards and said, Sheikh, why did you have that girl without a hijab sit next to you? And why did you ask her to sign the certificate? So I said, um, I'll explain to you. I asked her to sit down, and I said to this girl, how was your weekend? She said, well, uh, this was actually a very unique weekend for me because it was the first time I got to learn about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And she said to me, during the seminar, you know, I, when I teach the Prophet's biography, I, I love talking about the Prophet's life. I'm not sure if you guys Notice that or not, it's a, it's a passion for me. I get a lot of heat for this. People tell me, Sheikh, why is it every other class you do is on the Prophet's life? You know, there are some things that you just can't get enough of, like vanilla ice cream. <laughs> like, you just can't get enough of it. If someone says, why do you keep having vanilla ice cream? There's something wrong with you. <laughs> You're still on the dark side. You need to come to the vanilla side. You'll understand a lot better. <laughs> By the way, I have to say that vanilla ice cream is really good. What was that place called again? Uh, Tiff, Street. Tiff Streets, guys. <laughs> Value it while you have it. All good things come to an end. So, um, either you'll leave or they'll leave. Right? That's just the principle of life. So, uh, it's one of those things, and I enjoy teaching the Prophet's life. So this girl, she said that, you know, I attended the class, and I've attended, I usually tell my students that I take my, my prophetic biography class, that get ready for a roller coaster of love for the Prophet. You're going to go on a roller coaster. You're going to love it. And they say, yeah, whatever, okay, whatever. But you know, when you learn about the Prophet's life, it is a roller coaster. It's just so beautiful. Sometimes you feel like you're sitting right there and you think, oh my God, that's just phenomenal. So this girl said to me, after the first day when I came, my dad forced me and then I kind of liked it a little. So I said, let me try day two. So I came day two thinking that I was just going to have the free coffee and breakfast and go back home. But when I came, I started listening and I enjoyed it. 
And I stuck through the weekend. And at one point, my sister elbowed me and said, what are you doing? And I realized that I was actually crying. And I said to her, and she said, I wiped my tears. And I said to my sister that, I can't believe I'm crying in the love of the prophet. I think I love the prophet. <laughs> something, something a 15-year-old girl would say, right? <laughs> I think I love the prophet. And her sister said, what? <laughs> she said, yeah. Like, I, I didn't realize that he was such a cool person. Th these are her words, by the way. You know, it's a very childish language, but you know, it, these are her words. And I think the beauty is in those words. And then um, she said to me that all these years I heard the prophet's life all the stories I heard, they were just so dry. You know, I heard them in Sunday school. There was no emotion involved. I always thought the prophet and his companions were like, you know, wood sticks. What are they called? Stick men. You know stick men? <laughs> Have you guys ever played that game? What's it called? On the phone? Not hangman. That's old school. <laughs> the, the, it's, it's a, where, you, where you blast the doll? Stick wars. Stick wars. Yeah, this guy. <laughs> Hardly working. You're not doing good. I played those games by the way. Actually, let's forget. Okay, let's talk. Let's focus. <laughs> We're talking, okay, shut up. So, um, yes, so building emotion, understanding where the life of the Prophet Sallallahu is, where people, she says to me that I thought all this time that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's companions didn't experience emotion. And the second I realized that these were real people who actually had emotion, it shocked me. And I finally thought to myself, this is someone that I can actually relate to. And I said to her, what are you planning to do? She said, I'm planning to now go back and read the Prophet's biography again. But this time, I'm going to read it with one hand on the Prophet's pulse. You guys understand that statement? You know when you have your hand on someone's pulse, you can feel when their heart is racing, when the emotions are flowing. And you can feel when they're sad, you can feel when they're angry, you can feel when they're down, when they're up, when they're happy. She says, I'm going to go read the Prophet's biography again. And this time, rather than focusing on the incidents, I'm going to try to focus on his emotion. And that's one thing I tell everyone. You know, one of the biggest issues that we have is that people have taken Islamic sciences to be very dry. And it's time that we revisit these sciences again while understanding the spirit of these sciences. And that, you know, was also a big point that I delivered and I drove in the, in the Jummah Khutbah. I drove this point in the Jummah Khutbah that it's important that we bring back the spirit of our religion. That we sit back and look at things not only as uh, an academic exercise, but we sit back and look at them and say, what was actually happening right here? Okay. And when you do that, it'll help you understand much more about the life of the Prophet Sallallahu So with that, we pray that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala accepts from us all. Allah Azza wa Jalla gives barakah in this gathering. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala allows us to attend uh, these sort of gatherings again and again, inshallah. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala allows us to understand the mercy of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May Allah allow us to be beneficiaries of the mercy of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala make us amongst those who are honored to be in the group of people who, who, is, who are interceded on behalf of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.